This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Good morning, Arnie. This is a great weekend, Scott. How are you doing? I'm great. How? Why? Why? Is why it? is this a great weekend? Because you and I are film buffs. Oh yeah. And as you know, and our listeners who have listened to some of our previous shows, my great uncle George was a filmmaker who made more than seventy films, and my dad, for a number of years, worked for Universal Pictures. So I grew up in a movie home, so to speak. Yes, and, you did. And this week is uh, the Big Sky Film Festival going on in Missoula, Montana, one of the premier uh, film festivals in the United States and certainly one of the best in, in the West. It's for nonfiction films. And over this course of this week, over 150 films are going to be screened in front of 20,000 people in uh, little old Missoula, Montana, 150 nonfiction films. And, and so... We've watched, as uh, as I've been here since the beginning, right. 2003, we've watched this film festival grow and mature, and there's a, a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, repertoire of, of films that are presented every year, and uh, we're fortunate enough today to uh, have on our show one of the producers of uh, one of the featured films that actually is going to air uh, or, or be shown this afternoon at 2.45 at the Wilma Theater. Right. So, uh, you know, 100 years is the name of the film, and our guest uh, on the show today will be Michelle O'Hayan, who's the producer of the film. It was, uh, I think it was directed by uh, Melinda Janko. It's a very interesting story Yeah, about uh, a Blackfoot Indian tribal woman uh, uh, financial officer who uh, spent 15 years of her life fighting with the U.S. government to... Uh, Repay over uh, 300,000 Native Americans who over the course of 100 years had been deprived of hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars worth of income off of oil rights. It's an incredible story. It's an incredible story. It takes place in Montana, a good part of it. And, uh, uh, you know, she's, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, Eloise Cobell, the woman that it's about, passed away in 2011. But this is a a great story. story of her life and her dedication to uh, a cause uh, that was rooted in the 19th century. I mean, it's a, it, and, and goes along in a path that kind of, uh, you know, celebrates what's happened, you know, uh, something good about uh, what's happened with the Native American community, right. along with, you know, the exploitation that took place for a long, long time. So I'm excited to talk to her about this film and some of the other films that uh, that she has made, Colors Straight Up, which I, I saw a number of years ago, and you may have have seen, is uh, was an Academy Award nominated documentary about the gang members yeah. in L.A. who got together, who who were involved in a in a creative arts program, and ended up producing a movie. Part of the part of the documentary is about them making a movie called Watts Side Story. Right, you know, kind of based on based on West Side Story. She also uh, did a movie called Pressure in, in the 80s about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which, you know, has never cooled off. It's still, uh, you know, on high boil. And, and probably uh, if we revisited that film, all the issues from 84 are still, you know, uh, on the front burner in uh, 2017. So I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about uh, the film festival here and a movie that takes place in Montana. And uh, as you know, we have a rich tradition here in Montana, of great films being filmed here. Right. Um, and some of my favorite films have been filmed here. The last of which was, uh, you know, The Revenant. Right. You know, which won three Academy Awards last Leo year. Leo DiCaprio. Leo DiCaprio and the director won for and the screenplay won. And, uh, you know, Little Big Man was filmed here, one of the great movies with Dustin Hoffman. That was a long way back, but... Um, Runaway Train, The Shining was filmed here. Thunderbolt. Was The Shining? Yep. I didn't know that. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. That's where uh, Jeff Bridges met his wife in Livingston, Montana. Wow. Filming that movie. Horse Whisper with uh, Robert Redford. Uh, Heaven's Gate. (laughs) Known because it was considered by many one of the worst movies. A flop. Movies flop. But I like it, actually. I've seen it a number of times. Uh Uh-huh. With Chris Christopherson, great cast. Uh, Forrest Gump. Part of Forrest Gump was filmed here. One, One movie that... On every critic's list is one of their favorites. Right. Part of it was filmed here. Missouri Breaks with Jack Nicholson. And probably the most famous outside of The Revenant is The River Runs Through It. Right. Filmed right here. So we have a very strong tie in Montana. 
and rightfully we should have a film festival here, given uh, you know that that uh, repertoire of, of films that I, I just alluded to, and there've been many, many more. Those are just ones that I particularly like and have uh, viewed on numerous times over the years, and and uh, now we have uh, again another 150 films that are going to premiere over these these eight days during the film festival, and we're right smack dab in the middle of it. And we want to be interesting to to welcome our Moroccan-born, Israeli, brought up, Los Angeles living director or producer Michelle Ohian to the mic, and uh, maybe this is her first visit to Montana. Well, Let's find a- out. We're going to ask her about that, but you know it is. It's great that those kinds of person right. you described is now here. Yep. Not only attending the premiere, but they put on workshops here during the. Uh, during the film festival and train young filmmakers and, and be yeah. aspiring filmmakers. Yeah. And that's all, I think a very, uh, a very good part of the maturing of, of uh, the big sky film festival and the workshops. Right. So we will, when we come back, our guest will be Michelle O'Hein Academy award nominated producer. She's here with a hundred years. We are proudly supported and sponsored by Don Maddox, Glacier Sotheby's international realty on what do you know? We'll be back after this with Michelle O'Hayan. Okay, we are back with our guest, Michelle O'Hayan. Michelle, how are you this morning? Good. Hello from sunny L.A. Oh, good. Good to talk to you there, although your film will be airing at uh, 2.45 this afternoon at the Wilma Theater. Uh, As we mentioned in our intro, it's uh, 100 years, one woman's fight for justice. And let me just ask you, just to open up with, what drew you to this project? What drew you to uh, the Eloise Cobell story? Um, when Melinda Jenko, the director, came to me with footage that she had shot over almost 10 years of Eloise Cobell, um, I told her I rarely take on other people's films. I make my own, and it's a hustle, and so on. But she was very persistent, and I sat down and looked at the footage that she had, and I saw not just a woman that stands up for the rights of her people, but an ordinary woman who was an accountant who put everything on the side, her family and her her work, to engage with an impossible battle for 20 years, to gain rights for her people. She had absolutely no agenda. And to me, she is an American hero. And being a woman, and a woman that's trying to stand up for what I believe is right through my movies, I, and that makes us a bit of activists, I related to her plight, and I thought this story must be told. And unfortunately, even though she's considered the Rosa Parks of Native American nation, not a lot of people know her story. Um, and we're very thankful that uh, even though she passed, uh, President Obama had honored her with the Medal of Freedom before he exited office. Yes, not only do um, not a lot of people know about her story, not a, pe- not a lot of people even in Montana necessarily know right. about her story. And she mm-hmm. was, uh, you know, she was a leader of, uh, the, you know, the Blackfoot tribe here. So um, Exactly, I mean, exactly. And, you know, it's, a, it's really, um, it's a modern-day Aaron Brockovich in a way, uh, yes. and I'm very drawn to those stories. I'm very drawn to David and Goliath stories, which is, this is one. And also, you know, one of the things I learned from previous movies that I made, especially one called Steal a Pencil for Me, about a couple who fell in love in the Holocaust and survived. Um, the survivor told me, never, ever be a bystander. If there is one lesson I've learned from my 30-year career, this, this will be the one. And, and that's what Eloise Cobell did. She was not a bystander. She could have said, you know, it's hopeless. We've tried. We've battled with the bureaucracy. Forget about it. But she didn't. And, um, and, that, and that really, also the fact that it's a character story, that you follow one woman, is, is very, right. um, it's in a way simple. But it, I do believe that you tell the big picture through sure. intimate personal sure. stories to make it accessible. So and what, what was it about this ordinary woman that gave her the ability and the, perse- you know, the, the, the patience and perseverance to take a 20-year you know, journey in Odyssey like this in which she was thwarted over and over and over again? I think that she was a strong believer in her cause. And 
every time, as she says in the film, where she would feel discouraged or she would feel she would lo- was losing the battle, she would go to Ghost Ridge, which is the sacred uh, grave uh, area of Native American, and would remember uh, the history and what happened there and would gain courage from it and continue yeah. to persevere. And I think at some point she was too far in the process to quit because that will be not only her quitting, but her whole, all, all her people quitting. So she had to go on. I think, and I think what comes through in the film really beautifully is the support of her, the Native Americans, of the people she's fighting for. I mean, they, they have been fighting for years and have gotten nothing, so they're like all in with her. Right. And she's, you know... Well, it was a hundred year battle of 300,000 people being denied, you know, what they were duly entitled to. Exactly. You know, that is correct, and, yeah. And one woman was able to accomplish that for them. Which is that's right, and 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 that's why we we definitely wanted to be in Montana to tell the story. But every screening we have and have had throughout the country, um, a lot of indigenous people show up, and uh, they just they are so moved because they feel that finally somebody is telling their story in their own voice, um, and they feel that you know they are not alone for once. And that's really, we, we didn't expect such amazing reactions. I mean, we knew the film was the film, but uh, it really has touched a lot of a lot of people. Well, as, as we all know, often the Native American community in the media uh, is not always cast in the best possible light. You know, right. and, and the stereotypes about them and their lives and what, you know, what's happened to them is uh, is often just brushed aside right. and and uh, you know in in a in a swarm of other kinds of issues even the pipeline right. issue that's going right. on now is the sa- the same issue there are people that think they shouldn't be out there protesting and and uh, they have uh, right. they have a, a, a tremendous amount of folks like you um, are important to tell the story and the story has to be told over and over again so they can get their due justice that's right and as we know history repeats itself unless we learn from it and change it so this is this is a lesson in in justice and this is also a lesson in trust because when the native americans Mm. were offered quote-unquote by the government to uh, handle their lands on their behalf because they thought native americans were stupid and they were not allowed they were not able to handle it the native american trusted that and that was, of course, the first mistake. And what happened is that, n- next thing you know, on their land, whether sacred or not, you have oil companies, gas companies, taking and extracting and exploiting their lands and their resources while they themselves don't have running water. Right. So it, this is... Well, and the, issue, and the issue remains timely, uh, you know, with the current administration pushing as its number one issue, you know, uh, an issue right. related to immigration and who are real Americans and who mm-hmm. deserve to live here and who don't deserve to live here. You know, it's, as, right. top, it's as topical right. as ever. And this is a good story and, and a good morality lesson in, in what happens, you know, when uh, you don't take control of your own destiny. Yeah, that's right. And also a story that unites people rather than divides people. Right. And uh, again, for the reactions, People, even, you know, the elite of New York, they come out of the screening going, screaming. They're so angry, A, angry at themselves that they didn't know about it, and B, what, how is that possible? And, and I'm talking, this is a part, bipartisan, because the Louise went through right. four different administrations, so it's not even a political, uh, partisan issue, but it's just a matter of nobody wants to make change, a change, especially if it's a monetary change, on their watch. Uh, right. And I, I see it even in my new film that's coming out this year called Power. It's about energy and the geopolitics behind it. It's the same. Governments, the, they don't want to make changes, even though it improves our lives, because they don't want to spend the money now and be considered the president that or the government that has right. a hole in the budget. They want to sure. keep um, the can down the road. They sure. want to keep, let me. The, one of the striking things about the film is how you're able to pack a lot of emotion um for the for the viewer in seventy six minutes, um, I mean yeah. you're appalled that they're so trusting. They're so trusting, and you feel for them. But then you see that they're constantly let down. So you're like, 
How can this be? Well, and also it's not, just, and it's also the visuals. The visual of the mm-hmm. woman with the broken windows in her right. house and the five oil wells pumping on her land is a, mm-hmm. is a great visual to you know to sort of sum up the the uh, the, the conflict in, in a nutshell. Michelle, in your research, in your research of getting involved in this project, did you meet any of the families, um, or was it really you and Melinda directly? It was me and Melinda first. And then every screening we had, uh, we invited uh, subjects from our film, such as uh, John Eckerhawk, Tex Hall, and they travel with the film. Uh, we're going from here to Washington, D.C. for the Environmental Film Festival in March, uh, where um, uh, Keith, the lawyer that's portraying the film, who is now yep. the U.N. ambassador, uh, he will be coming there. So um, there's really not much um, from a Louis family that, that we can, but a lot of uh, families that uh, are on our website, we, we keep in touch with everybody, and they interact with us through the website as well. But Melinda is also very involved, and she has gone several times to various reservations to show even a rough cut. Um, outdoors and uh, to, to, to get everybody to know we're still doing this because it took so long. Uh, people thought, okay, this film is never going to end. Right, um, right. But, uh, but then, you know, I came on board and put a team around her and we, we raced to the finish. Right. Um, so how she's very ago, involved. How long ago mm-hmm. was that that you got involved? I got involved about three years ago, and uh, every time we raised money, we continued cutting, and then we ran out of money, and then we stopped, and we continued. And, um, you know, it really was down to some angels that uh, helped us. And also uh, the tribes really stepped up sure. and raised money and, uh, and, and helped this film. So let me ask you this. You're, <clears throat> you're in a business where um, you're producing nonfiction or documentary films. And it must be a real labor of love, not only to produce the movie, but to raise money for this kind of a, a production. The whole industry itself... Um, you know, at the Big Sky Film Festival, they're going to be screening, as you know, uh, 150 mm-hmm. films. These are films yeah. that are never going to make money in the traditional sense of the movie industry. And and what do you have to go through in order to raise money for a for a film like this or some of the even your your Academy mm-hmm. Award nominated uh, you know films, Color Straight Up, had to be a, a difficult to raise money for. Yes, absolutely. First of all, you said in my business, so let me scrap the word business. Okay, it's not a business. <laughs> right, right off the bat. It's not a business. <laughs> not a, no, but it is, but it isn't. Um, look, I mean, for me, making documentaries is a choice, and it's a calling, and it's my way of giving back to the community in the best way I can. I'm also fascinated with education, so every film we make or I make has an educational component to it. Even College Straight Up, we wrote study guides and for two years circulated with the film in the schools and so on. And we're planning to do the same with 100 years. We already have requests from schools and colleges because it touches upon many subjects, such as even legal. Uh, law schools right. want it. Indigenous people want it. Uh, women's groups want it. So, But to go back to your question, you know, it's there is... For example, I actually screened a movie at Big Sky many years ago and won an award there. It was called Cowboy de la Mor. Right. And, right. yeah, so, you know, that actually made money because it was a, a comedy, in a sense, breaking the stereotype of the cowboy, you know, the American cowboy. And we sold it to Showtime and to Netflix, and we, we more than covered. Well, that's But good. usually, yeah, but usually films that have a, a, a serious message with a cause uh, behind it, are very unsexy in a way, unless they are extremely provocative. Um, so raising money is really people who care about the subject, and sometimes uh, grants. Uh, we got a grant from the Nova Foundation, that's the Peter Buffett-related foundation, and uh, because they're very uh, conscientious and aware of Native American issues, but, and also like a thing with our EP, who was very helpful. Mm-hmm. But yeah. normally, that's why we had to start and stop. It, it, it is very hard. And but fortunately, because I've been doing this for so many years, I have a team that is they know that they can go and do their commercial movies, and then they take a break and they do my little films. That mean more than anything they do. So sure. if I had to pay them, I could never afford them. But they are top of the line people, like our composer Nick Pike, 
our our editors, um, everybody involved. Our, our sound uh, re, uh, re-recording mixer is a guy who works with David O'Russell, you know, and he took a few days off to do ours. No, the quality um, the quality of the production is is exemplary. Michelle, is there someone that um, actually, from a production standpoint, helped bring it over the finish line that came in with funding that you want to mention, or are they anonymous? Uh, some of them are anonymous, and the rest I've mentioned already. Okay. Um, yeah, and and so now we're trying for, to find a home for it. Uh, we approached PBS, uh, we approached uh, ABC, we approached Netflix, of course, that has been my home for so many years, mm-hmm. to see if they will take it on. Uh, Sony Classics reacted very positively to this movie. Uh, so How about CNN? When- How about CNN? CNN, um, unfortunately, they passed. Uh, it was an earlier stage of the film, but, uh, you know, I know them, and I, mean, I tend to go back to them because of, you know, the reviews have been great and the reactions have been great. But right. it's not easy. Uh, today's documentaries, and I serve on the executive committee of the Academy on the documentary branch, and we we always try to see how we can balance the big uh, documentaries that have huge money machines behind them and sexy subjects, with smaller documentaries that don't have the means for exposure that have to struggle and keep up with the rest. And that is a big issue. Um, like everything else, you know, money pushes it to the front. To the front. Sure. And we were lucky we were somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still, it's still not enough. Sure. Um, it is a labor of love. You know, I can't, you know, it's very hard. Uh, that's why I make my own movies and work for others. And I also have a company that connects Hollywood with the rest of the world, so you try to find five things to keep you afloat. Right. So uh, let, me, let, me, let me switch gears for, for a minute. Uh, early in your career, you did a, a film called Pressure about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm-hmm. Is that movie, is that, is that documentary still fresh today in terms of uh, what it portrayed over 30 years ago? Unfortunately, it is. Um, that goes, I could say that about all of my films, actually, and again, it's, I wish all these problems would go away. That film was made in before the first Intifada, and uh, it was based on a true story, and I think still today it is very hard to find couples, mixed couples, Arab and Jews, that manage to survive without any pressure from the society, mm-hmm. uh, even the most liberals, they still look at it in a, in a negative way, and so they don't hold that much. So this film, yeah, if you would show it today, it will be, and I have showed it actually at Wesleyan College in, the, in their political studies, and it's, um, you know, it's the same. It would be the same. It's unfortunate. It's the same. Yeah, so it's what, unfortunate. So what drew you as a young woman in Israel to, to a filmmaking <laughs> career? I Listen, I was born in Morocco, right. and we immigrated to Israel. My parents were film buffs mostly French films, because they didn't speak the language. Um, and so I grew up with a, in a very cultural home. Uh, and I had about six months before graduating from high school in the Army, because you have to be 18 to enlist, um, mandatory. And yes. I had six months, and I found a job as an intern in the Israeli television. And at that time, it was still film. And I sat in the editing room, and I was just, blown away by, wow, there is audio and there's video and it's technical and it's kind of captured everything I wanted to do, both storytelling and uh, the technical aspect also interests me and, and the visual language, how you tell the story in images. Mm-hmm. So I enrolled in Tel Aviv University, that was the first year that they even had a film department and I was one of the lucky ones that got in. But so you're, for a, me, pi- you're a real pioneer. In, in I'm, a, I'm a real pioneer. I think my teachers were maybe two years older than me and had <laughs> one movie one movie behind them. That's, that was about it. So needless to say, I didn't really feel like sitting in the classroom. I would just take the camera. Everybody wanted to party. I just wanted to make movies. I don't like parties. So <laughs> I, I, on the weekends, I would just make movies, thankfully, because the teachers had nothing to say. So the only thing they would say is, if I would bring footage, they had something to talk about and analyze. So I really, like, it was almost like a private. I got a lot of uh, lessons, and uh, they took me to work on their productions, and 
Uh, my first film that I was actually paid for was a film with Robert Mitchum and Ellen Burstyn. I was the head of casting. They shot in Israel. It was called The Ambassador. Mm-hmm. And Rock Hudson's last film, I think. Mm-hmm. And, oh, my God, that was a, a lesson. And and uh, I was just blown away by all the logistics. And I, I wanted to make movies. There was nothing else for me. So during school, I worked uh, also, I edited a lot of films because it's really helpful to know how to edit so that when you shoot, you edit before you pre-edit or pre-visualize, and then you come to set and you're ready. Uh, So that has helped me, and I always recommend it to people who start, and you know, everybody wants to be a director, but you go, well, before you're directing, how about... You start with editing and shooting and learn, and so you can speak the same language right. as your crew, and not just come from the top. And then what? And what led? Then what led to your your immigration to Los Angeles? <laughs> well, it's it, it's quite simple. I you know there was not even a master's degree in Israel, and I felt that the, at that time, especially the industry was so small, and everything was in Hebrew. And I and I thought I'm going to spend three, four years on a movie that nobody's ever going to see. Not Israelis don't like Israeli movies, so they will not see it either. <laughs> so what, what am I doing? So um, I met at the time my, my husband, who is from Holland, and uh, he's a director of photography, and we both uh, wanted to work in a place that we can actually speak a, a language that people understand instead of Dutch and Hebrew. So we immigrated here and have kids here and uh, have Angeles. been working since. What yeah, year was that, Michelle? What, when did you... When was... uh, we immigrated in... Uh, 87. Oh, boy. So a long uh, time. So you're a producer on this film, 100 Years. You've been a director and writer. At, what's, what's, the, what's your favorite, uh, I guess, aspect of filming? What do you like to do the most? Or is it I, I, all I, I like above? to be in the field. I like to be in the field. Uh, there's various phases that have my favorite part of them. Um, for example, if I do research, which I do a lot, my favorite part of the research is revealing the story. As I read, I find gems. Uh, for example, when I did Steal a Pencil for Me, again, about the love story from the Holocaust, um, I decided I was not going to go to the Museum of Tolerance and use the footage that had been seen over and over and over and over mm-hmm. again. I was going to find new footage. And, of course, everybody laughed because, you know, everybody had looked for it already. Um, but I did find some home videos in Holland that nobody had used before in a movie, Super 8 and 8 millimeter, like a dentist had filmed from his window, the Germans marching through the streets of Amsterdam. And the story is based in Amsterdam first. So I integrated, so that for me was a revelation, or I found a still of the liberation train of the woman that's in the movie that she had never seen. And of course that Mm. um, put her life upside down. Wow. So those, those are the research gems. And then, in filming, what I like is the unexpected, which is why I do documentaries and less fiction, which is scripted. Um, I come to set and I think this is going to happen. And of course, either the opposite happened or nothing happens or three things happen. And my challenge and, and my thrill is to be ready to capture it as it happens and as it unfolds. And not only ready to capture it, but capture it in the best visual way possible and that's where experience comes in you know when to move the camera you know when to zoom in or you know when to come close and when to stay back and that and the 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 trust that is built between me and my subjects no matter what and who they are whether they are gang members in south central like in college straight up or richard clark who you know i made a movie with him about national security Mm -hmm. the trust is crucial and um you have to find every, you have to utilize everything that you've got to every resource to A, create the trust and implement that yes. at the end in the editing room and tell the story with integrity, um, even though you really want to show the ugly stuff, but you don't because the this, subject trusted you. Is this your instinct that this is how you approach it or is it something you learned over time from different mentors? You know. Unfortunately, I didn't have mentors. I wish I did. As I mentioned to you, Israel was so young, and there was right. no one. And my mentors were the Russian documentarians. I read their books inside out, and Pudovkin and Eisenstein. Those mm-hmm. were my, those who, you know, where I learned. It was a lot of instinct, intuition, and um, 
just being a people's person and the first thing you need to to know how to do as a documentarian like journalists is to listen yes and when you listen instead of just going through your questions because you typed them last night at midnight and you want to get through you need to to hear and and build on what you hear to get deeper and deeper and deeper so, and so michelle but, even today there aren't that many women filmmakers what what mm-hmm. what is what, what was your experience like you know back in uh, you know the eighties when you were trying to do this and uh, and how has it changed over time since then for women in the industry? Yeah, I think in documentaries in television it's a little better, but when I was trying to get into the fiction world, which is really where I started, um, so I remember coming here and you know calling agents and trying to find a representation and. Uh, some agents who are now heading big, big agencies, so I'm not going to name them, <laughs> would say, oh, we already represent one woman director, so we can't take you on. And I was like, well, and how many men do you have? Oh, you know, 100, 200, 300. <laughs> so that was hard. So I gathered some of my lady friends in the industry, and we founded an organization called Cine Women, which basically was a network uh, support system for us to hire, to give leads to women or jobs and so on, or just come to set and learn, whatever it was. Um, And we did that for many years. Um, And, you know, it has changed, but I still, if I'm competing over a job and there is a guy who has the exact same experience as I do, most likely he'll get a job. And I've been there. I've been there with, you know, Disney Studios and, you know, when we were uh, adopting College Straight Up to Feature, uh, we had MGM was very interested. I had Morgan Freeman as my producing partner and actor. And we went to MGM, and they basically said, why would we hire you? We only had three or four women directors in the whole history of MGM before you. So I said, well, because it's my film. And mm-hmm, so that's... I had to go through the hoops. When was that? It... When was that? That's that was about said that. 12 years ago, 15 years wow. ago. It was a long time ago. Wow. And uh, if, and if wow. it wasn't for Morgan Freeman stepping up for me, saying, uh, excuse me, why are you calling her a first-time director? Did she not just get a nomination for a film she made? I'm totally trusting her. And so they said, Good okay. For him. Good for both so, of you. Yeah, right, and that's... that's- uh, yeah, having Morgan Freeman stand up is like having God stand up for you. Literally. So, literally. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, right. <laughs> but like, you, but you I think, had an early I- inkling of about all this. I think I think when you you'd mentioned earlier you'd worked on the movie The Ambassador, and as I recall, th- that movie didn't have very many women characters even in the movie. I think Ellen Burst- Burstyn was the only you know, yeah. major f- woman that That's was right. in that film. And, That's um, right. She was the wife. Yeah, she was the wife in the film. And... Uh, uh, you know, historically, that that you know that that was the case. You know, you you yeah, rarely that's, see. That's another reason why I wanted to do the Louise Cobell story when it came to me, because I do, I do feel that every opportunity right. that is valid to show a female protagonist is a good opportunity, especially if it's a positive one. Right. And so that that was definitely one of the reasons. So do you have a, a, a slate of films in your mind or, or, I mean, do you know what you're going to do after, you know, you've done Power? I mean, do you have a number of films lined up or do you, you yeah. seize on one good opportunity uh, at a time? Um, unfortunately, because there are so many stops and starts, you have to have more, than, I have to have more than one film. Right. Uh, because we don't know which one is going to take off. So we have Power, as I mentioned, the energy film. We launched the work in progress at the Climate Change Summit in Morocco, COP22 in Marrakesh, um, and showed it to energy experts as part of the conference. It was great reactions. So we're finishing it now. I'm just waiting for a narrator to be locked in, mm. and we'll launch it this year. Um, I also finished a film that just started streaming on Netflix called Christina, Mm-hmm. Uh, about my friend who went through cancer and asked me to film her. So it's a very intimate uh, journey uh, that is very inspiring for people who are either going through or have family members who are going through. And that's, again, it's streaming on Netflix right now. Um, and then I have a few ideas that I pitched to Netflix actually yesterday um, together with other films that I'm consulting on. One is on the Mustang horses that are roaming on uh, on public lands and the the battle over the lands between 
the government and how they can be extinct if we don't do something about it. Um, so those are some of my movies, and I'm consulting on a Dutch movie called Mother Beauty about the concept of beauty from the time of Marilyn Monroe until today. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's... <laughs> this all keeps. Five. This is all exciting stuff, and it must keep you energized uh, constantly, because you have a yes, you have you know, a broad my, range of of films. They all have an emotional, you know, string to them, emotional spine to them that makes them, uh, you know, uh, you know, I guess convey your passion about the topics. Yeah, and I, you know, I always think about, the, okay, is this going to be a movie that I will be proud to show to my children or not? And uh, that's that's number one. Two, can I have the audience feel these people? Can I am I qualified enough to understand this subject and be able mm-hmm. to go deep enough to expose the heart of the subject so people can actually touch it? Um, can I distribute this film? So all all of these are factors in determining if if I am going to be on this journey in the next two or three years because it is a long journey. Uh, but the emotional angle is extremely important to me. I'm not really into intellectual movies. Even in the national security movie, SOS, State of Security, mm-hmm. you know, Richard Clark is not an emotional guy. He's a brain guy, a security guy. But I went around that and found former generals, former CIA members who had felt strongly that they have failed during 9-11 and confessed, such as Richard Clark did. Right. But in a very emotional confession, so I went that way. Um, so th- so that, that's really important to me. You know, a documentary for me is almost like a historical document. It's just right. it's told from a point of view of a filmmaker, and it's an interpretation well, of the reality. If you watch the early days of this current administration, yeah. you could do a documentary in real time, couldn't you? Michelle, <laughs> oh, that's the truth. Michelle, are there uh, other folks that you collaborate with like uh, that share your passion, That just folks that you work with on film to film to film, like an editor or... Yes. Uh, who are yes. they? Um, uh, first of all, Kate Amond is my editor, my longtime friend and editor. She cut three movies for me. She's also the our governor of the documentary branch. She's an old timer. She doesn't want to do any fiction. She's just into documentaries. She has a very gentle touch, and I love the poetic rhythm that she comes up with for the movies. I mean, I can sleep at night when I know she's she's editing. Sometimes, like with Cabo de Amor, I had to wait a year until she was available, but it was worth it. Really? Who I else? have compo- composers that I swear by are both Richard Horowitz, <laughs> who is more of a world music guy. He composed Sheltering Sky. He is very into, uh, like I said, world music. And sure. Nick Pike, who did 100 Years, um, our film, uh, sorry, our song that he wrote um, was shortlisted for the Oscars as well. He's a very talented composer. So those two, and I have several directors of photography that I work with um, that rotate because, you know, films, documentaries are spread over a long amount of time so they can commit. So, yeah, I definitely, I have my team, but it's a very small team, very small. I mean, the only rule I have when I shoot is that everybody with the equipment can fit in one van. Because if something happens, then yeah, it's true. Budget. <laughs> it's the only rule I have. The only rule I have. Manage so expenses. We... Say again? You're managing expenses. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's, of course. But it's also, for example, when we're shooting in South Central, all the time we would be driving down <laughs> and seeing some drive-by or seeing some ambulances going where we want to stop. So imagine if my camera was in a separate truck, I would have never been able to shoot. So we all stop, we all get out, we all film and come back. It also gives you a feeling of a team so that everybody knows what we're doing, what I'm hoping to get. And I always encourage them to, if they see something that I don't see, please get right. it. Um, so it's a great feeling of team. I don't go in convoys expecting right. people to open their hearts when you have 25 people in front of their face. Right. That never works. Do, do many people reach out to you with ideas for, for films? Oh, yeah. Everybody, when they ask me, so what do you do? And I'm, I'm you know, quietly whispering I'm a documentary filmmaker because I know they're going to hit me with, oh, I have a great story for you. My mother, my brother, my sister. And they're all valid stories. 
um, everyone has a story and everyone wants to tell that story. Right. So that's on a personal level. But yeah, of course, you know, Netflix came to me with an idea. And other people came to me with ideas. And, you know, if, if, I, if it grabs me right away and if I, two weeks later I still think about it, then I know that I have to sure. pursue it. Sure, sure. Uh, ever- if, if it goes away, the next day forget it. Have you ever had the opportunity to work with your sister, with your older sister, Annie O'Hayan? <laughs> of course, Annie O'Hayan. Oh, my God, she saved my life. She d- um, Tell she, us how. Uh, for example, for Power, the movie, we wanted a singer and a song, and she brought Angelique Kijo, who is a multiple Grammy Award winning Fantastic singer. singer. Yeah, and so she wrote a song for the movie. Not only that, when we went to Marrakesh for the Climate Change Summit, she performed at the concert at the end of the conference, and that was, you know, a lot of Annie doing. Um, Annie connects me to music people when I need to, and, right. uh, you know, she's like the music arm of, of, uh, of my film arm. Right. <laughs> Annie is, uh, just for our listeners, Annie's a friend of mine, but also an extraordinary network, public relations person, connector from the music industry for many, many years. You know, so two, yeah, daughter, veteran, two daughters. Two daughters that have uh, uh, skills excel. in the industry. <laughs> right. Well, 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 you, we have two more in Israel that are doing <laughs> similar things, but we're not. <laughs> Is that right? We're not going to go there. I had no idea. Well, what, what, yeah. what's really exciting about what you do in general, I mean, the, the, you know, the whole repertoire of films that you have, is you memorialize, you know, for all time, very important events and individuals. You know, at that point in their life and that point of the issue, and they're, and they're there for, for, for the record, so to speak. I mean, you can remember mm-hmm. reading about something, but you have captured an, a whole array of important issues and important, uh, you know, experiences, and you can always go back to it again, just like seeing pressure or color straight up or now, you know, with 100 years, and, and, and mm-hmm. you, you have the, you know, the, the record of it. You've made the recording and the yeah. record of that activity. Yeah, it's true, and we should also mention, you know, my actual very first film here in America was called It Was a Wonderful Life, it was narrated by Jodie Foster, Melissa Etheridge did the music, and it was about women who were middle to upper class, but for one reason or another lost everything they had and fell through the cracks and ended up homeless, but living secretly in their cars while keeping the facade of being the upper class. So they would have a fur coat and they would clean up themselves up in department stores, but still they would be homeless and even their kids wouldn't know. And that was shocking to me when That's I came That's shocking to me States. now. <laughs> where, 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 can yeah. you, where can we find that? Is, that? is it on Netflix? It was a wonderful life. Uh, no, it was on Netflix, but now it's on uh, Filmmaker's Library. If you, type, if you Google it, it will come up in various places, also Amazon. I'm very anxious um, to see that. That's, fa- that's fascinating. I would never have known that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was also about women. And uh, again, it touched a lot of people because a lot of women came to me and said, you know, we're a paycheck away and, you know, that can happen to us. And it's again, uh, the big picture is that the infrastructure here in the United States is not uh, able to right. support and sustain people who fall even for a few months. Right. Well, most Americans don't have any safety net whatsoever. Majority of Americans. Have no safety net. No. It's true, but on the other hand, you also have the family that is not supporting their own, and that's something that in Israel would never happen. I right. mean, even if I would be homeless for two years, I would have a place to crash. Either be, but here, <laughs> yeah, Either, yeah. Well, look, right. let's take a quick break. We're going to finish up sure. with Michelle O'Hein uh, on "What Do You Know?" presented by Don Maddox, Glacier Sotheby's International Realty. Back after this with our final segment with Michelle. Okay, we are back with Michelle O'Hayan. So, Michelle, the, the film, 100 Years, is going to be screened uh, on this, on the, today at uh, 2.45 at the Wilma Theater. And then again on Tuesday, there'll be another uh, performance of the show. And you and... Uh, on Wednesday, sorry. Excuse on Wednesday. me, on Wednesday. Excuse me, on Wednesday it'll be, mm-hmm. it'll be screened. And uh, you and Melinda Janko, who is, uh, who is the filmmaker on this, will both be here on Sunday, today... Um, to uh, to talk about uh, the questions and answers session for the film. Is that correct? Yes, we will be there and we'll be very happy to meet everyone and answer any questions they may have. We'll also send them to our website so they can be in touch with us, 100yearsthemovie.com. There are a lot more screenings coming up. And we want to engage the audience 
so that they are staying active, not just uh, showing up for the movie, which is great, but we want them to follow this process uh, and be involved with us throughout this journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Michelle, so um, the website is, what is it, 100? 100 years, the dot com. Oh, right. Okay. And if somebody wants to reach out to you... If, with an idea, you have uh, you you have your own entertainment production company, yeah. Kavana. Is that's, that right? That's right. Kav- Kavana in Hebrew means intention. Yes. So everything you do, you do with intention, and they can reach me through Kavana Ent dot com, uh, and there is my email address, and they can contact me for for anything. And if they have ideas and want to host a screening. Of any of our movies, uh, we're very happy to to do so. We're very accessible, um, and and we also, you know, we want we want to build a community of love around this film and others because we do believe that today's audience is not just the theater goers, but of course the digital audience, and right. uh, we we think that every eyeball is a, is a ticket holder. That's how we view our. Our followers, so we would love to have uh, everybody sign up and, and be part of this. I think I think the Native American community, the more folks that are exposed to this film, how proud they will, will feel and right. how much pride they will have in this film because it really is they overcame and uh, well, it's, it's, it's a moving and it's a it's a good positive story with a absolutely. positive outcome. It doesn't have a negative outcome. It's really it's a That's very right. moving and, film, and I think it's, it will be inspiring for for people who have who have that one thing they have to do in their lifetime that they haven't done yet and they feel strongly, that will maybe push them over the edge to really go and do and take action. And in today's climate, of course, we all need to take action. It's mm. not even a choice. No, we absolutely you have, have no to. choice. So it's the an, only it's choice an imperative. Is cause, right. right, and the only choice is which cause you're going to support. But there is no sitting at home and complaining is not no longer no. a choice. So no. the first thing to do is show up to the theater. That's step one. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, Michelle. And then we... We'll engage you. You've been a mm-hmm. fantastic guest. We could talk to you for hours. Yeah, you're great. There's a Thank lot to you. learn in uh, in uh, having a conversation with you, and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you at the screening of your uh, of your film, and uh, good luck on your other projects. I can't wait to see the rest of your the rest of your uh, films being produced and made. Thank you so much. I really appreciate having me on, on your radio show, and I'll see you on Sunday see very soon. Okay, okay. The, you take care. Remember, the film okay. is 100 years, and it's screening today at, and Wednesday at the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. Arnie, I'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO. 